This all happened over a decade ago, but the memory is as vivid as if it occurred yesterday. Most people in our small town think my brother Tyler simply got lost in the woods and died of exposure. The local news covered the story for a while, speculating on various theories. But eventually, interest waned, and people moved on with their lives. The police closed the case, concluding that it was a tragic accident. My parents, clinging to the hope that Tyler would come back, finally accepted that he was gone. But they never knew what really happened, and I never told them. You might wonder why I've kept silent all these years. The truth is, I didn't think anyone would believe me. What happened that day in the woods was so bizarre, so beyond the realm of reason, that I'd be labeled crazy or worse. I kept my silence, attending therapy sessions and nodding in agreement when people offered their condolences or theories. Inside, though, I was screaming. But now, after years of carrying this burden, I need to get it off my chest. Maybe this account will serve as a cautionary tale. Or maybe it'll just confirm what some have suspected that I've lost my mind. Either way, I can't carry this secret any longer. Here is what really happened that fateful day in the woods with my brother Tyler. Tyler and I are in the woods, each holding a paper bag to collect leaves for our school project. The sun is shining through openings in the leafy ceiling above us, casting patches of light onto the ground. Tyler is holding up a maple leaf with a huge smile on his face. Hey, this one's cool, right? He asks, enthusiasm evident in his voice. Yeah, that's a great find, I respond. Put it in your bag. We still need to find an oak and a birch leaf to round out our collection. For the next half hour, we are immersed in our leaf collecting task. The forest floor is covered with a thick layer of leaves, some old and some newly fallen. The sound of leaves crunching under our boots fills the air as we walk. Our paper bags start to fill up with various types of leaves. During this tilere, I notice that Tyler is particularly focused, his eyes darting around as he searches for the ideal leaves. I admire his attention to detail. He's the kind of person who always wants to get things right. I'm a bit more laid back, but together we make a good team. Despite the focus on our task, I can't shake off the feeling that the woods are different today. The air is heavy, and the usual sounds of wildlife are strangely absent. Birds are not singing, and even the wind seems to be holding its breath. Suddenly, Tyler gasps. Whoa! Look at that pond! He's already running toward it before I can even respond. The water in the pond is glimmering, reflecting the sunlight in a way that makes it look almost magical. Hey, wait up, I shout, picking up my pace to catch up. My boots kick up dirt and small stones as I run, but Tyler's already gone ahead, vanishing from my view. My calls for him, Tyler, Tyler, bounce back at me from the tree trunks and foliage unanswered. The woods, once filled with natural sounds, are eerily quiet, amplifying my solitude. The wind picks up suddenly, sending a chill through me, Leaves shake in the trees, rustling as if whispering secrets I'm not privy to. My skin tightens, and I feel shivers run down my spine. The air itself seems to thicken with tension. I reach the pond where I last saw Tyler heading and start my search, shouting, Tyler, where are you? My voice dissipates in the air, swallowed by an uncanny silence that makes me uneasy. I start to check the logical places he could be. My eyes dart from tree to tree, analyzing each one as if expecting him to suddenly appear. I look behind bushes, even pushing some branches aside, but find no trace of him. Then, my gaze falls on the pond itself. Could he have fallen in? With a sense of dread, I peer into the water, half expecting to see Tyler's face looking back at me. But the pond is just a dark, undisturbed surface, offering no answers. For a moment, I'm paralyzed, overcome by a rush of thoughts and emotions. I'm not just looking for a lost brother now. I'm in the middle of a situation that spiraled into something far more troubling. 
My hands are dirty from scrambling around the forest floor. My paper bag of collected leaves is forgotten, and the weight of the situation sinks in. The pond, the trees, and even the air seem to press in around me. In this heavy silence, my worry transforms into a gut-wrenching sense of dread. For a moment, I stand there, torn between two options. One part of me thinks it's smarter to go back, to get help from adults or even authorities. Yet, the image of Tyler possibly lying hurt somewhere in the woods holds me back. I imagine him scared, or worse, injured. The thought is unbearable. Determined, I decide to keep searching for him, occasionally shouting his name. But my calls are met only with the unsettling silence of the forest. Tyler passes, and I can't say how much, but it feels like hours. Just when despair is about to completely overtake me, I spot a figure in the distance. It's Tyler, standing next to a cabin that looks like it's been abandoned for years. The wood is weathered, and some of the windows are broken. Running over, I shout, Tyler, what on earth are you doing here? I've been searching everywhere for you. He turns around, a smile stretching across his face. Sorry, I got sidetracked. Isn't this cabin awesome? As I stand there looking at Tyler, I should be engulfed in a wave of relief. The tension that has been building up inside me should be dissipating, but it isn't. Instead, a new type of tension takes its place. We begin our walk back through the forest, retracing the steps that led us to this strange, abandoned cabin. The sun is still up, but noticeably lower in the sky, casting longer shadows that stretch out like dark fingers on the forest floor. We're both carrying our paper bags, and as we walk, we pick up a few more leaves to complete our school project. Tyler seems enthusiastic, bending down every now and then to grab a leaf that catches his eye. Look at this one, he says, holding up a leaf with a peculiar pattern of spots. Kind of looks like it has freckles, doesn't it? Yeah, that's a cool find, I reply. But even as I say it, I notice something slightly odd about the way he's holding the leaf, as if he's never held one before. It's a tiny thing, almost imperceptible, and I tell myself I'm probably imagining it. We continue collecting, and Tyler takes the lead, pointing out the different types of trees as we go along. He identifies an oak, a maple, and even a birch, each Tyler picking a leaf to examine before adding it to his bag. Yet. Even as he names the trees correctly, I notice that he pauses for a fraction of a second before each identification, as though he's trying to remember what they are. We walk in silence for a few minutes, the only sound coming from the leaves crunching under our boots. I try to shake off the weird feeling that has settled over me ever since we left the cabin. Maybe I'm still rattled from the scare of losing him, I think. The route we're taking seems familiar, yet strange at the same Tyler as if we're walking through a place that's an almost perfect replica of the woods we know so well. The odd sensation stays with me, but I can't put my finger on what's causing it. We have to get back home, I say, my voice tinged with a sense of urgency that I hope he picks up on. Mom and Dad will be freaking out. Not to mention Max, our dog. He's going to think we abandoned him. Tyler nods in agreement. And for a moment, I think I might be imagining things. But then, as we begin the trek back through the dense trees and foliage, he casually throws out, Yeah, I bet Susan and Robert are worried. Susan and Robert? My words come out more as a reflex than a question. My heart doesn't just skip a beat. It feels like it stops altogether for a split second. No one calls our parents by their middle names. It's always been mom and dad. You mean mom and dad, right? I ask, trying to give him an opportunity to correct himself. He laughs, but the sound is awkward, almost forced. Yeah, of course, mom and dad. I'm now hyper aware of every move he makes, every word he says. The comfort and safety I should be feeling right now are replaced by suspicion and apprehension. The earlier sense of dread that I'd managed to suppress is now back in full force, settling in my stomach like a block of lead. I want to dismiss these feelings as mere paranoia, 
the result of an overactive imagination fueled by the day's strange events. But deep down, something tells me that this isn't simply a matter of an overactive imagination. Something is genuinely wrong. My instincts scream at me to be alert, yet for the sake of my brother, I shove those warning feelings aside and continue walking. The silence between us is heavy as we continue walking. Each step I take is accompanied by a growing sense of dread that looms larger in my mind. The usual sounds of the forest seem to have muted themselves, as if the trees and animals are also aware that something is wrong. Breaking the quiet, he says, So, how's Bella? My head jerks toward him as I hear the unfamiliar name. Who's Bella? Our dog's name is Max, I say, my voice edged with disbelief. For a moment, he seems off balance, his eyes avoiding direct contact with mine. Right, Max. I meant Max, he quickly corrects, but his voice lacks conviction. By now, alarm bells are not just ringing in my head, they're blaring. This person walking beside me can't be Tyler. My thoughts race as I consider what to do next. Confronting him directly could escalate the situation into something I'm not prepared for. My hand slips into my pocket and grasps the small pocket knife I always bring on hikes. The metal feels cold against my skin, a chilling contrast to the situation I find myself in. The knife might not be much, but it gives me a sliver of confidence. As we walk, my mind is busy constructing a plan because I know I have to act soon. Whatever this thing is, I can't let it walk out of these woods pretending to be my brother. How did you find this cabin anyway? I ask, my voice steady despite the whirlwind of thoughts in my mind. I just stumbled upon it, he answers, lifting his shoulders in a casual shrug. It's cool though, don't you think? I nod, all while my mind is frantically searching for a way to confirm the nagging doubts that have been growing since we reunited. Then, a light bulb goes off in my head, a question that only my real brother could answer correctly. Remember the summer we built that treehouse with Dad? I throw the question out, watching his reaction closely. He smiles and nods. Yeah, that was fun. The Tyler has come for the real test. What did we find in the old chest in the attic that we used for the trap door? This is a shared memory that only the three of us, Tyler, Dad, and I would know. If he's my real brother, he'll remember. His face changes subtly, a flicker of hesitation crossing his eyes before he answers. We found some old books and toys. A chill courses down my spine at his words. He's wrong. We'd found Dad's old baseball card collection in that chest. A treasure we'd sworn to keep a secret between the three of us. This person may look like Tyler, sound like him, and even act somewhat like him, but he's not Tyler. And now I know for sure. I can feel the weight of the pocket knife in my pocket, its presence both reassuring and ominous. What's my next move? The creature beside me isn't just impersonating Tyler. It's a threat. It took my brother away and I can't allow it to harm anyone else by leaving these woods disguised as him. We're almost there, he observes, pointing toward the lighter space ahead where the density of the trees starts to lessen, signaling the way back to our home. Yeah, I answer, my words laced with a melancholy that only I could possibly grasp. We're almost there. Every step we take brings us closer to the edge of the forest, closer to a point of no return. My fingers grip the pocket knife even more firmly, almost as if trying to draw strength from it. Options whirl around in my mind, each one more difficult to consider than the last. Yet, the realization is crystal clear. I have to act. This thing beside me is not my brother. I can't let it out of these woods to endanger my family, my friends, or anyone else it might encounter. Though the decision is gut-wrenching, my determination solidifies. I am committed to doing what has to be done, no matter the emotional cost. With my pocket knife gripped tightly, I'm ready for what comes next. 
I stare into the eyes of the creature pretending to be Tyler. Who are you? My voice is low, firm, and carries an edge of resolve. The knife's blade is now out, pointing directly at it. The imposter hesitates, its eyes shifting briefly, as if contemplating its next move. What are you talking about? It tries to sound incredulous, but the words come out shaky and unconvincing. Ignoring its weak protest, I press on. Answer the question. You're not Tyler. Who or what are you? My voice gains volume, ringing out through the surrounding woods, leaving no room for deception. Suddenly, it lunges at me with a speed I didn't expect. I barely managed to sidestep, feeling its fingers graze the fabric of my shirt as it passes. I swing the pocket knife in a defensive arc, but the creature is fast, too fast, ducking under the blade and tackling me to the ground. We tumble and my pocket knife is knocked from my hand, landing a few feet away. Desperation surges through me. I need that knife. The creature's hands close around my neck squeezing with a strength that defies its human form. My vision starts to blur at the edges, and black creeps in. Then, with a surge of adrenaline, I manage to free one arm, balling my fist and smashing it into the creature's face. It howls, grip loosening for just a moment, but that moment is enough. I take advantage of its temporary distraction to wrench myself free. Scrambling to my feet, I lunge for my pocket knife, fingers closing around the handle. The creature is back on its feet too, lunging at me with a snarl. This Tilir, I'm ready. I sidestep its attack, and with a quick, upward motion, plunge the knife into its side. It screams, a horrible sound that reverberates through the trees and burns into my memory. As the creature's scream fades into an unsettling silence, its body starts to convulse. Its skin ripples, as if being pushed from underneath by countless invisible hands. The colors shift rapidly, like a chameleon under extreme stress. Its face distorts first, the eyes enlarging and becoming an inky black, then sinking into what now appears to be a mass of pulsating gray flesh. The features that made it resemble Tyler melt away, leaving behind a blank, amorphous surface. Its limbs elongate and twist grotesquely, bones cracking and reforming in unnatural configurations. Fingers merge, then split again into long claw-like appendages. Its body contracts and expands in a sickening rhythm, the clothing it wore as Tyler tearing apart and getting absorbed into its form. Finally, what stands before me is a creature unlike any I've ever seen. Its body is a waving mass of gray flesh, speckled with darker spots that appear to move on their own. Multiple appendages extend from its body, some ending in sharp, talon-like structures. The eyes, now multiple, are black orbs that seem to absorb all light, giving nothing back. The creature falls to the ground, and its form loses some of its cohesion as it dies, becoming a slightly less defined heap of gray, pulsating matter. It lets out one final, low gurgle before becoming still. The forest around me seems to take a collective breath, as if expelling a poison from its midst. My mind races as I stare at the creature's lifeless body. The implications of what just occurred start to take shape in my head. I need to get back. But what then? police, questions, and maybe even accusations. And all the while, I'll know that the story I have to tell is too incredible, too horrifying to be easily accepted. I glance around the woods. I'll need to leave the creature's body here. Taking it with me would only raise more questions I can't answer. But I can't just leave it for someone else to find either. In a state of near automation, I start to gather leaves and branches, piling them on top of the dead creature. It's not much, but it's the best I can do to conceal it. I notice my hands are still shaking as I work. The weight of my actions and their consequences are settling in, but there's no Tyler Ray to fully process it now. I look towards the path leading back home, 
mentally rehearsing the story I'll have to tell. A lie is forming in my mind, one involving Tyler getting lost and my failed attempt to find him, avoiding mention of the creature entirely. It's a distasteful, awful act to even consider, but the alternative is a truth no one is prepared to hear. I take a deep breath, feeling the cold air fill my lungs. I put the knife back in my pocket. Its blade is still stained by the creature's remains. I'll clean it later. Right now there are bigger issues at hand. With one last glance at the pile of leaves and branches that is now a grave, I turn and make my way back to the path. I step onto the path, looking neither left nor right, and start the long, lonely walk home. As I walk through the front door, I brace myself for what's to come. Mom and Dad are in the living room, their faces etched with worry. Where's Tyler? Mom asks, her voice laced with a panic I know all too well. I take a deep breath. We got separated. I looked everywhere, but I couldn't find him. Dad's face hardens. You left him out there? No, Dad. I searched for hours. I was calling out his name, but there was no reply. Mom's hand covers her mouth, and she starts to cry. Dad grabs his phone and dials 911. My son is missing. We need help searching the woods. Yes, I'll hold. As I stand there, listening to my dad talk to the police, guilt and regret churn inside me. I know Tyler isn't missing. He's gone, taken by that creature. But I can't say that. Not now. Maybe not ever. Hours later, the woods are crawling with police, search dogs, and volunteers. They're calling Tyler's name, shining flashlights into the thickets and up into the trees, hoping for a sign of him. But I know it's in vain. A police officer approaches me. We found something odd, an animal body, covered with leaves and branches. Did you see any strange wildlife while you were out there? I hesitate, then shake my head. No, just the usual birds and squirrels. I know exactly what they've found, but I can't let on. He nods. Well, it's likely just a deer. The team is removing it now. A deer? Is that what they think that monstrosity is? Relief washes over me. As long as they believe it's just an animal, no suspicion will fall on me for its death. But then, I remember why it had to die in the first place, and my relief turns back into sorrow. Days turn into weeks, and still, there's no sign of Tyler. Flyers with his face are all over town. Have you seen me? They read, a question I find myself asking over and over, even though I already know the answer. My parents are a shadow of their former selves. They're still holding on to hope, going on TV to plead for any information about their missing son. I stand behind them during the interviews, my face a mask of anguish that requires no acting. But underneath it all, I'm plagued with a relentless guilt and sorrow that's entirely my own. In the quiet moments when I'm alone in my room, I replay that day in my head. Could I have done something differently? What if I had never gone deeper into the woods? What if I had insisted we both turn back for help? Questions with no answers, a past I can't change, and a truth too horrible to speak. Days turn into weeks. I sit in my room, staring at the calendar. The date circles when the search for Tyler is officially called off are in red. It's a heartbreaking day. When mom and dad find out, the atmosphere in the house becomes even heavier, if that's possible. We have to accept that he might not come back, Dad says, his voice thick with unshed tears. Mom shakes her head. I can't. I won't. I listen, feeling like an intruder in their grief, knowing that my pain is tinged with a guilt they can't even begin to comprehend. The authorities assume Tyler got lost and died of exposure, a notion my parents bitterly reject. Deep inside, I want to shout that they're right. Tyler didn't just get lost, something horrific happened to him, something unnatural. But I can't bring myself to say it. They'd think I'm insane or worse, responsible. I'm going for a drive. 
I announce suddenly, needing to escape the oppressive sorrow that fills our home. Dad looks at me, a bit surprised. Are you okay to drive? I'm fine, I lie. The drive is aimless, the turns random, but somehow I end up at the entrance of the woods. The same woods. My hands grip the steering wheel tightly as I stare into the dark expanse of trees, half expecting that creature to come sauntering out. But it's just woods now. Ordinary woods that have witnessed something far from ordinary. I drive back home, avoiding eye contact with my parents when I walk through the door. I go straight to my room and take out my pocket knife, the same one I used that fateful day. Looking at it now, it's hard to believe how ordinary it appears. Just a knife, yet it's so much more. I wrap it in an old cloth and put it in a box of things I no longer use. Finally, I throw it in the trash. It's Tyler to let go, even if just symbolically. Days keep passing. Friends try to reach out, but I keep to myself. You okay, man? You've been really distant. One of them texts me. Yeah, just going through some stuff. Thanks for checking in, I reply, keeping the conversation as brief as possible. My parents, seeing my withdrawal, try to get me to talk. You should see a therapist, Mom suggests one night at dinner. I shake my head. I'm fine, really. I'm just dealing with it in my own way. What way is that? Dad asks, his eyes searching mine for an answer. For a sign that I'm coping better than they are. I'm writing. I lie again. It helps to get it all out. But the truth is, I'm not getting it out. I'm locking it away, deep inside, where it festers and haunts me in quiet moments. I know I can't keep this up forever. One day, the dam might break and my dark secret will pour out. But for now, it stays buried, locked away like the most shameful part of my soul, too terrible to bring into the light. Weeks turn into months, and life, in its cruel, indifferent way, moves on. But I'm stuck in that moment, standing next to a creature pretending to be my brother, knife in hand, choices to make. I replay it over and over, each Tyler searching for a different ending, but it always concludes the same way. I'm left carrying an unbearable secret, a weight that grows heavier each day. I look in the mirror and barely recognize the person staring back at me. I've changed, in ways that are more than just physical. Mom and Dad continue to mourn, their hope a dim flicker that refuses to go out. They'll never know the full story, and maybe that's for the best. Years have passed since that haunting day in the woods. I've moved to a different city and started a different life, but the past is never really past, is it? It's like a shadow, always there, lurking just out of sight. I've had relationships, jobs, and moments of happiness, and yet the secret stays with me, a constant reminder of the terrible cost of that day. I've avoided the woods, any woods really. I stick to the city, to concrete and steel, places where the line between the natural and the supernatural seems more defined, less porous. My parents have aged. Their faces show the wear and tear of a life burdened by a tragedy that never received its due closure. I call them. I visit. But there's always a wall now. A wall built from the bricks of a lie too big to ever dismantle. Why are you sharing this now? You might ask. It's a question I've asked myself many Tyleris. The answer is simple, but not easy. I can't keep it locked away any longer. It's eating at me, corroding me from the inside out. I've come to realize that a burden shared is a burden lightened, even if just a little. So, I'm writing it down, sending it into the void of the internet, where maybe, just maybe, it will find those who can carry a piece of this terrible truth with me. Do I think people will believe me? Honestly, it doesn't matter. This story, this confession, it's not for them, it's for me. It's to acknowledge that what happened was real, as real as the screen you're reading this on, as real as the air you're breathing. And if by some small chance, 
Someone out there reads this and realizes that they're not alone in carrying a dark and terrible secret. Then it's worth it. No, I can never undo what happened, never bring Tyler back, never unsee the things I saw. But I can unburden myself of this secret, set it free, and hope that in doing so, I find a modicum of the peace that has eluded me all these years. Because some truths, as terrible as they are, need to be set free, if only so they stop poisoning the soul they're trapped in.